Canada has been an important trading partner of India. It's the home of uh, millions of Indian immigrants. It's also one of the preferred destinations for Indian students to study abroad. There's now a complete downward spiral in diplomatic ties between India and China. How is this likely to impact people-to-people -people ties? What happens if you want to study in Canada, work in Canada, move to Canada, get married in Canada? And what's likely to happen next, given this current deterioration? Will things change only if there's a new government after the next elections? And what should anyone watching at this time really do? Joining us on this broadcast, I want to welcome uh, Brahma Chalani, leading strategic affairs expert, former advisor to India's National Security Council. I have uh, Maruf Raza. Maruf Raza is a strategic affairs expert in his own right. But here he is in the capacity of the managing director of Access Abroad Education Consultancy. They send a lot of uh, young students to countries like Canada uh, to, and to the UK, etc. Uh, Kamal Sibbal joins us, one of India's best known uh, foreign secretaries, ambassadors. I've got Daniel Bodman joining me, senior correspondent at uh, National Telegraph. And Dr. Mukesh Agi will be joining me in some time from now. Uh, he's the president of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum. So I want to go across to Kamal Sibbal first. Mr. Sibbal, given what has happened this week between India and Canada, how do you see relations between these two countries span out from here? And especially given the high level of interest in things to do with Canada amongst those who want to move there, get married there, study there, work there. You know, how should all of them really be looking at Canada from now on? Well, we are entering into a very, very difficult phase of relations uh, with Canada. That has been the case for some time now, even uh, Trudeau's uh, attacks on India uh, political attacks on India, which began in September last year, rather unexpectedly, where he went to the parliament and made all kinds of charges against uh, India, which he has repeated uh, since. I think we'll have to wait till there's a change in government in uh, in Canada. If the conservatives come come to power, we may see a progressive easing of, of tensions. I don't think that can happen immediately because that will be totally disavowing not only Trudeau but also the RCMP and their so-called investigations which haven't produced anything but yet it's a it's a very significant arm of the Canadian uh, security system. Uh, so I think some uh, dialogue will begin after that to try and uh, uh, bring about some normality in ties but it won't happen immediately. Number two, the Khalistani, pro-Khalistani, all those elements uh, are active, will remain active, will continue to try and poison ties between the uh, two countries. Some other allegations uh, will be made through the media, uh, through, through uh, their lobbies that, are op that operate on the ground, which will continue to create doubts uh, in India-Canada uh, relations. In so far as uh, the people you mentioned, students or those who want to uh, go there, or get married there, or whatever else in terms of their personal uh, choices, yes, there will be a big issue uh, because uh, they will be, they'll find it very difficult uh, to go there. In fact, what has really happened is that uh, the diplomatic ties between the two countries have effectively been broken. When you remove the ambassador and all the senior officers from both countries, then who's there, going, who's there left to manage uh, the uh, missions? and ensure that they function. They won't be able to function. Uh, so therefore, many of the things which you mentioned require proper processing, the proper staff, the proper vetting, proper references to the government to and fro and everything else. This is, this is not going to happen. So I think there'll be a lot of uh, problems for the Indian uh, Canadian community. And I hope, I hope that they will begin to put pressure on the Canadian government to come to their senses and uh, not further ruin uh, the ties between India and Canada, keeping in mind that when Stephen Harper was the Prime Minister of Canada, we made significant progress. We overcome the differences over the nuclear issue, a nuclear agreement was signed. Canada also agreed to sell uranium to India. We started the FTA negotiations. All that was, but then this fellow, uh, I'm sorry to call him the way, call him the way I am. I think he suffers from a genetic disorder. Uh, which is inherited from his father. He just can't see straight when it comes to India. He's totally blinker. His mind is 
totally in mind is totally incapable of addressing the relationship with India in a sane political manner. So I don't know what his psychological problem is. It's, it goes far beyond politics. Okay. Uh, Brahma Chalani, it's, it's almost as if Canada is the new Pakistan, uh, which is pretty bizarre because Canada so far was seen by millions of Indians as a place to potentially study. Many wanted to go work there, live there. Now, with diplomatic ties being worse than Pakistan, uh, what do you think is likely to happen from here? They're saying we've given evidence to Ajit Doval in Singapore. The Indian government says no evidence has been given. None of us really know what was shared, how credible it is. The government is saying what was shared was uh, you know, in, uh, non-substantial, meaningless. Where do you see India-Canadian ties going from here? What's your advice to all those who are watching and saying, hey, what do we do with our Canada story now? First, the India-Canada relationship is not worse than the India-Pakistan relationship because we have all these other uh, the people-to-people -people ties with Canada. Uh, Canada enjoys a trade surplus with India. The trade between Canada and India has been booming. So certainly, uh, the Canada-India relationship is not worse than the India-Pakistan relationship. As far as evidence is concerned, normally in the past, whenever a country has blamed foreign agents for a killing on its soil, that country has usually presented forensic video or audio evidence. That evidence has been presented publicly to back its allegation. And usually, such a country has avoided blaming the foreign country to which their agents belong so that they can leave room for the possibility that rogue elements were involved. And thirdly, no government in the past, while making an allegation of foreign agents' involvement, has named the prime minister of the country to which these agents belong. Now, in the case of Trudeau, not only has he presented no iota of evidence publicly, despite promising a year ago that he would make that evidence public, but he has cast the entire blame, not on the agents of India, but on the Indian government. And then he has named the Modi government repeatedly. So he has virtually ruptured the relationship with India. He has become the obstacle to the India-Canada relationship. The fact is that not only is he deeply unpopular at home in Canada, he's under pressure from his own Liberal Party to quit because the Liberal Party believes that if he remains the party leader and the prime minister, the Liberal Party will suffer a major drubbing in the election that will be held next year. So at a critical junction, when his own political future is at stake, he decides that by making these sweeping allegations against India, and he's gone beyond the allegation that he made 13 months ago, he has broadened, those, broadened that allegation. Now he's claiming that India is involved in running a criminal syndicate in Canada. And he has done all this to divert attention from his mounting domestic problems. Sure. The, pro the, the challenge for India is to salvage the relationship with Canada while spotlighting the role that the Trudeau government has played in sheltering and shielding Sikh militants who are openly glorifying terrorism against India. In no. a way, history is repeating itself. What happened in the first half of the 1980s that led to the twin Air India bombings, same developments are repeating themselves now. And to some extent, the Indian government is responsible because the way the Indian government let Canada off the hook over the Air India bombings, the two Air India bombings of 1985, we did not wake up to what, what was happening under Trudeau, under, under Justin Trudeau, until Trudeau woke, uh, stood up in Parliament and made that allegation against India 13 months ago. Sure. We ignored uh, Dr. Agi, you know, you're based out of Washington, D.C., and you Sorry. see how India and D.C. are responding to similar charges. There in the case of uh, Pannu and the charge that Indian uh, Diplomats, stroke intelligence officials were keeping a surveillance on him, potentially planning an assassination versus the charges leveled by Canada on Niger. No, explain, because you can see what's happening in Canada. You're seeing at close quarters what's happening with D.C. The divergence in the approach, the same country, the same charge 
In both cases, India involved one nation acting with maturity. You know, we've even sent a committee to depose in the U.S. to fight to find some facts and put them all together. Whereas Canada seems to have completely gone berserk on this. Well, Raul, from the perspective of U.S., when you look at the charges in the process, one is charges are coming from the Justice Department, which has a thorough process in taking this forward. These charges are not coming from Biden administration as Trudeau is uh, driving it. So you have to understand this is not a political move on part of Biden administration. They're looking at it and India is cooperating from that perspective in a mature manner. So I think there's maturity, there's sensibility, there's a sense of trying to find a solution because the relationship is more important. Whereas in the case of Canada, Trudeau is in trouble politically. He wants to basically divert the attention from his failures and basically sacrifice the relationship with the government of India and the Indian people to basically salvage his failing uh, prime ministership. So I think it's important to understand that while U.S. has taken a much more mature process-oriented approach, Trudeau is basically hurling uh, allegation in India without any evidence itself. How do you see this move from here? Given that, you know, we're handling this with the U.S. very differently from how this is being handled with Canada, how do you see, because, you know, there's a lot of talk of these five eyes coming together, countries like the U.S., Canada, Australia, uh, all of them cooperating together uh, on this issue, trying to put pressure, because we've also seen while the U.K. and the U.S. have made noises, they haven't been quite as belligerent as Canada has been. I, I think you have to understand there's an issue of mindset. And the mindset is that when India is rising, you have to position India in its own place. And I think the Canadians have to understand that you have a country of 1.4 billion people, an economy which is going to be $5 trillion by 2027. It is a power by itself in the region itself. And I think that's the behavioral acceptance of India position is driving some of these decisions. And, and from our perspective, when we see from a U.S. side, when you look at U.S. companies, they see India as a potential de-risking from China. They see India as a potential market for the future itself. You have an economy, when you compare uh, both Canada and, and India, Canadian economy is slightly over $2 trillion. India by 2027 will be a $5 trillion economy. And the purchasing power is going up. And we can see the Indians are buying more and more U.S. products itself. So I think what we're saying is a shift and, uh, in behavior, and that has to be accepted by the Canadians, that India is a rising power, and you have to deal from that perspective itself. You know, it's been 48 hours since India-Canada diplomatic ties broke down.